And it is a good day. This is Misanthropic Gods reporting to you from the internet for Tuesday, January 16th, 2018. You are listening to Newsreel, the WOD Global sit rep on core political tyranny, technology, and trends for your headspace and timing. I am taking a stand for free speech today, and by listening to distributing this program, you are too. This is a test episode of a potential new run of Newsreel. We have no owners, no masters, and we're not making any money off of this. We have zero distribution strategy, and my only plan is to scream into the void to try and keep myself sane and maybe entertain you too along the way. If you have any way that you could help support the show or have new articles to contribute, well, we'll figure that out later. Without further delay, from 20 seconds into the future and the bleeding edge of the dystopic society we predicted in the 1980s, here is the news. In room 641A news, AT&T says it may soon charge you extra for privacy. From the people that brought you the literal backdoor into all of your internet traffic, a top AT&T executive says the company may soon return to charging customers an additional fee to protect their privacy. In 2016, AT&T quietly started charging between $531 and $800 more per year if customers wanted to opt out of AT&T's Internet Preferences program, which uses deep packet inspection to track and monetize user behavior around the internet. AT&T was heavily criticized for the move and ultimately stopped charging the extra fees but only to help secure regulatory approval for its Time Warner merger. But with the likelihood that its latest massive merger will go through, and AT&T having just successfully lobbied to kill consumer broadband privacy rules and gut net neutrality, the company says the privacy surcharge may be returning. If you review AT&T's prior practices in regards to this, note that while paying this additional money stopped you from seeing targeted ads, it didn't actually stop them from collecting the data. They just weren't giving you ads for it. Other companies like Comcast have stated they'd also like to explore the option, which comes as no surprise at all. With the telecoms industry facing less regulatory oversight than ever, it's extremely likely that this won't be the last attempt for them to make even more money out of your private data. In drone war news, I have two separate stories that both actually involve Russia, but are very different styles of new information coming out about the potential use of drones by both state and non-state actors. The first story is that Russia has underwater nuclear drones, leaked Pentagon documents reveal. Russia possesses an underwater nuclear drone capable of carrying a 100 megaton nuclear warhead, a recently leaked draft of the Pentagon's nuclear posture review has confirmed. The Russian undersea drone, officially known as the Ocean Multipurpose System Status 6 and nicknamed Canyon by the Pentagon, was reportedly tested in November 2016. It was launched from a Serov-class submarine. Status 6 has a range of 6,200 miles, a top speed in excess of 56 knots, and can descend to depths of 3,280 feet below sea level. It was built by Rubin Design Bureau, the largest submarine manufacturer in Russia. It was designed to be launched from at least two different classes of nuclear submarines, including the Oscar class, which can carry four Status 6 drones at a time. Pentagon officials warn in the posture review that Russia has actively diversified its nuclear capabilities, a strategic advantage it has over the United States. In the report, they stated, quote, In addition to modernizing legacy Soviet nuclear systems, Russia is developing and deploying new nuclear warheads and launchers. These efforts include multiple upgrades for every leg of the Russian nuclear triad of strategic bombers, sea-based missiles, and land-based missiles. Russia is also developing at least two new intercontinental range systems, a hypersonic glide vehicle, and a new intercontinental nuclear-armed undersea autonomous torpedo. And the second in my set of stories about drones, Russian bases in Syria attacked by drone swarm. On 31 December 2017, Russian forces in Syria faced an assault by 13 locally produced drones. Technical analysis of the captured drones revealed that they were able to autonomously carry out attacks after being launched from approximately 100 kilometers away. These attacks were launched against Memima Air Base, Russia's military operations headquarters in Latakia Province, and Tardis Naval Base. Ten drones attacked Memima while another three attacked Tardis. Six of the drones were jammed by Russian electronic warfare assets, three of those were taken control of and successfully landed. The remaining seven drones were shot down by the Panzer S mobile air defense platform using both conventional anti-aircraft cannons as well as surface-to-air missiles. These drones were guided by GPS and carried an explosive payload consisting of metal BBs epoxy to an explosive core and the use of repurposed mortar fuses, all contained within a plastic fin housing. The coordinated attack killed two Russian service members and wounded ten others. 
as well as causing minor damage to as many as a dozen of Russia's fixed-wing attack aircraft, as well as helicopters, and significant damage to at least one Sukhoi-24 fencer. A swarm attack by drones, such as this one, is really unparalleled thus far. There have been plenty of documented attacks by small numbers of directly piloted drones in places like eastern Ukraine or Iraq or Syria. Many times these drones are commercially available off the shelf items that have been modified to help relay reconnaissance or maybe drop a small explosive payload. Generally just, you know, one, one munition or so, almost exclusively unguided. These types of drones have had effective victories against unarmored targets like groups of soldiers or things like open hatches on tanks. But there's never really been such a large group of drones built from scratch that have been completely autonomous and only guided by GPS, instead of direct control from the ground. This is definitely an interesting aspect of modern warfare that intrigues me, and something that I'm going to keep an eye on with interest moving forward. In the product is you news, it shouldn't come as any surprise, but Facebook has the technology in place to track and connect two people through the camera they've used and metadata associated with the photos that they've uploaded. These metadata attributes can even include lens scratches, lens dust, or camera artifacts, and more, according to a patent that Facebook filed back in 2015 that just recently came to light. The patent describes a technique that would connect two people through the camera metadata associated with the photos they upload. It would assume that two people knew each other if the images they uploaded were titled in the same series of photos, or even if lens scratches or dust were detectable in the same spots on the photos, revealing that the photos were taken by the same camera. It would result in all the people you've sent photos to showing up in one another's People You May Know section. This People You May Know feature is crucial to Facebook's $500 billion business plan. People with more friends use the network more. Facebook's growth team explains why increased user engagement is so important to them. It leads to a corresponding increase in advertising opportunities, quote unquote. In other words, the pictures that you take, the data that you provide them, and the people you may know is crucial to Facebook's bottom line. Just keep that in mind whenever you are participating in social media. In tactical transhumanism news, at a conference near Washington, D.C. last February, the commander of Naval Special Warfare Command made an unusual request to the defense industry. Develop and demonstrate technologies that offer cognitive enhancement capabilities to boost his elite forces' mental and physical performance. We plan on using that in mission enhancement, Rear Admiral Tim Szymanski said. The performance piece is really critical to the life of our operators. Szymanski expanded on his remarks in a brief interview later, saying he had his eye on a number of technologies, including pharmaceutical aids. But the result of one breakthrough involving the direct application of external stimulation to the brain had particularly caught his eye. Transcranial electrical stimulation is one of the technologies touted by Defense Secretary Ash Carter in July 2016 as part of his Defense Innovation Unit, Experimental, or DIUX, initiative. Since then, multiple SEAL units have been actively testing the effectiveness of the technology. Quote, earlier this year, Naval Special Warfare Units, working with DIUX, have begun a specific cognitive enhancement program with a small group of volunteers to test and evaluate achieving higher level performance through the use of neurostimulation technology called HALO. Captain Jason Salata, a spokesman for the command, said in a statement, The elements testing the technology include Naval Special Warfare Development Group, the unit known more popularly as SEAL Team 6. Other teams are also conducting the test, Salata said. He declined to confirm how many operators are participating in the testing or to cite specific findings to date. According to other sources, the number of Halo devices being used by elite units for testing is in the double digits, adding they are being tested at five military installations. Naval Special Warfare has said that there have been positive outcomes so far. Early results show promising signs. Based on this, we are encouraged to continue and are moving forward with our studies. Although some experts have warned that the full long-term side effects of using neural priming to improve performance may not be known. The inventor of the technology being evaluated has said, lab tests have repeatedly proven that the product, which is commercially available in a sport configuration, is safe. But really, we're using our soldiers as guinea pigs, and who knows what the actual impacts will be 10, 20, 30 years down the line, or what type of technological developments are going to come from this. In Q Branch news, about a year ago, the Lucas County Sheriff's Office in Ohio purchased some tech straight out of Q Branch of MI6. This new game-changing piece of gear is a GPS dart. The launcher for the dart is attached to the front of a cruiser's grill, 
and an integrated laser pointer allows the officer to aim the device at the back of a vehicle very quickly. When the officer pushes a button, the dart is fired using a burst of CO2 and the projectile with embedded tracker attaches onto the rear of the suspect vehicle using a very aggressive adhesive. The tracker sends GPS data back to the dispatch center, allowing police to track the car from a distance. In April 2017, for the first time, a Lucas County Sheriff's deputy used one. The company that makes the darts, called Star Chase, markets them as safer than traditional pursuits, since suspects tend to slow down if they don't think they're being followed. The darts also allow for better planning, giving police time to organize a response ahead of the suspect as opposed to simply following behind. Lucas County Sheriff's Office Captain Matt Letke stated that the April's use was the perfect case scenario for the darts. Quote, one of the LCSO deputies caught the suspect dumpster diving and asked him to leave. But rather than leave, he pulled out a gun, got in his car, and began to drive off. The deputy who confronted the suspect was able to deploy a dart from the Star Chase system from the front of his cruiser. That dart stuck to the suspect's car, which allowed the deputy and dispatchers to track the suspect with GPS, rather than a high-speed pursuit. They were able to track him with GPS, and other jurisdictions got involved, and they knew his location and speed, and were able to get in front of him and get stop sticks out and stop him said Letke. The darts do raise some interesting Fourth Amendment questions. Is having a GPS dart in your car a constitutionally unreasonable search? Analysts with the ACLU said in 2014 that it really wasn't, but there's not really been any challenging or any type of analysis of it besides that. As long as police don't misuse it, I don't really have a problem with it as long as it's not being used by people who aren't actively engaged in a felony. I think that would kind of be where I would draw the line. If, if something that someone was doing was a misdemeanor, then not really. But if somebody was in the act of committing a felony and then got into their vehicle and tried to run, then I'd have no problem with my local police using this device. But it, it is an interesting turn because we've been hearing about this technology for years and this exact same technology was used fired from a handgun in Ghost in the Shell in 1994 and was probably in the manga before that. I haven't actually read all of it, but it's interesting to see the stuff that was the cyberpunk, really bleeding edge sci-fi interpretations of technology actually coming to pass. The Recomedia for this show is Cory Doctorow's talk, Fighting Back in the War on General Purpose Computers. This was actually filmed at DEF CON 23 and was his talk there. It's about 50 minutes long, and if you haven't ever heard any of Cory Doctorow's talks, it's really, really worth a listen. Um, he's very compelling, he's a great speaker, and he has some really, really good arguments. So I really recommend this video for a really interesting thought piece of technology, where we're at today, where we're going to be in the future, and the trends that have happened in the past and continue to happen now. I also have a second piece of rec media, which is Mega Cities, Urban Future, The Emerging Complexity. This dystopic nightmare is a five minute long video that was used as part of the Advanced Special Operations Combating Terrorism course that was offered at the Pentagon's Joint Special Operations University last year. Just check it out. It's like if William Gibson and Tom Clancy had a deformed love child. It's, it's both awesome and terrifying at the same time. Your piece of cyberpunk kit for the day is Predator Vision. If you watched the film Predator and had a raging heart on for the thermal vision overlay used by the alien, just like I have, this piece of kit is for you. With a see-through display and a compact, easy-to-use design, the AR Sense Thermoglass was just revealed at CES. It's made to bring a thermal vision augmented reality overlay into your everyday toolkit. It's made to be a standalone device that just attaches to your normal pair of glasses and is ready to go. The mounting system is compatible with regular eyewear, protective goggles, and safety helmets. At 23 grams, wearing the device is very easy and does not weigh down your head like other HUDs have in the past. The thermal imaging sensor is made using the tried and true FLIR long wave infrared sensor technology, but brings it into a more portable form factor that allows you to bring a whole new awareness of your surroundings to you. Your daily hack for this show is the open source underwater glider. There's been a breakthrough with low-cost autonomous drones, and this capability has matured into a wide range of hobby and commercial applications that have developed from it. Currently, there are no affordable extended-duration underwater exploration platforms, and this project is attempting to address this need. Using commodity hardware, 3D-printed parts, and open-source autopilot, they've produced a low-cost and versatile underwater glider capable of extended missions of up to weeks at a time. 
By having this platform available, it will reduce the cost of underwater projects for all, from hobbyists and amateur scientists to seafood farmers. It allows humanity to explore the seas more freely, and that's always something that I'm advocating for. Included in the ongoing page is instructions, additional details, files for download, and a whole bunch more information for all your undersea needs. So, like I said at the top of the episode, this is just a test and I have no idea when, where, or how any future episodes will be released, but I hope to see you on the flip side. Come find me on the Rangers IRC, the Rant Media IRC, or the Rant Discord. If you like the music in the background, check out Anders Manga. He just released a new album on Bandcamp called Perfectly Stranger. We leave you now with a track, At Dawn They Sleep, from his 2007 album, Bloodlush. Remember everyone, we cannot defeat the enemy if we are at each other's throats. And that's what Server said. End of line.